So I'm Lana and I am a professional gardener and my company is The Fine Gardener. And I love uh, doing horticultural consultations with people. We both teach and we both really love to teach. Uh, so that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, my company does specialize in small space design and consultate uh, and installations, um, environmentally friendly gardening, including um, helping people put together pollinator and native gardens. And uh, I also teach uh, plant health and pest management at Algonquin College. So all about the bugs. And hi everyone. Thank you again, Jason and Lindsay for the introduction. Um, I offer garden consults and installs. I'm also a garden contractor for the fine gardener, Solana. Um, I also this year have really been partaking in the grow your own food revolution and install edible gardens for my clients as well as teachable for teenagers and kids. Um, I have partnered with a woodworker to make planter boxes and raised beds. I'm a mom of chickens, bees, and mushroom mycelium. Um, I'm also a part-time plant science instructor at Algonquin College. I work at Renfrew Public Library part-time as well. And um, the pictures on the right-hand side are just some of my past and previous projects in the industry. So let's get this talk started. And what we're going to talk about, some of the points that we'll share with you tonight is we want to share with you where to grow and what to grow. We want to share different types of containers and sizes with you. Um, some of the more detailed uh, nitty gritty things like what kind of soil do you use? Um, how do you water? How do you feed? And then we're going to run through a really quick step by step as to how to put an arrangement together when you're growing at home in containers. Um, we've got a couple of example uh, sample arrangements to show you, um, just some pictures and some ideas as what you can put together. And then we'll also share some other considerations like why add flowers to vegetables? Um, we'll talk about po pollinators. We'll talk about some aftercare. And bear with me for one second. I got to move this box. Um, pests. We'll uh, tell you about all the good guys and some of the bad guys. And if um, we don't cover all your questions, then we'll save time at the end. And we'll also leave our contact information if you think of something afterwards. Mm -hmm. So. First off, we want to explain to you uh, why you should join the Grow Your Own Food Revolution because it makes Mother Earth happy, but more so, um, you know where your food is coming from beginning to end. It's that satisfaction of the flavor and freshness. Um, also, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but there is a, uh, the, the price of herbs has skyrocketed and so you can actually save money, especially by growing your own herbs. Um, you're creating a closed loop system. So if you plant your seeds correctly, um, one packet can actually of seeds can actually last you a very long time. Um, and if you grow something, you like that variety, then you can collect seeds and then those seeds will prevent you from buying or having to buy them again. Um, so as you can see, it's a very sustainable practice as well. And many of us can agree that the act of gardening or seeing what you plant and its maturity and then harvesting is very therapeutic. So tonight we hope that we can also convince you uh, to join the revolution that is occurring. All right, so the first thing that we wanna to touch is where to grow. And we always say that try anywhere that you're willing to experiment. Uh, with. And that's because plants require certain things. So anywhere in your backyard that you can meet the basic requirements of a plant to live, such as sunlight, uh, carbon dioxide, water, and soil as a substrate for nutrients, um, as well as ground and having roots uh, grounded, then you should try planting there. And questions like, can I actually get my shovel through the ground? Um, is there too much rock? Am I renting? Uh, will I have to replace the sod once I move? Is there a large population of rabbits and deer? 
Um, is it better and easier to do a container that I can fence in or planter boxes with wire mesh around them? So think about all of those questions that I just brought up. And then my advice is to, again, work with what you have. So contrary to popular belief, most of the crops that you'll be planting now require six uh, plus hours of sunlight. So it's better to actually plant in um, sun or direct sun because then you have more control and you can actually create the shade that you want. Um, and if you're working with part shade conditions, then try growing, you just may get a lower uh, yield. So that's what we recommend for choosing a site. And your bed types vary in complexity. Do not panic. I'm not going to go over every single one. <laughs> um, and going in a clockwise direction, um, there is up at the top, in-ground raised beds, uh, sorry, in-ground gardens, and then going into in-ground raised beds. There are container raised beds, planter boxes, uh, and containers. So again, determining your bed type is extremely situational. And if you use in-ground beds, um, you're gonna try to think about using organic material or adding in organic materials such as compost, mulching, um, using landscape fabric. And for larger containers like raised beds, you want to consider purchasing 107 to 112 liter bales of soil, um, or you can get yards of soil and compost delivered to you. Um, but as I said, or Lana mentioned, today we're gonna focus on container gardening, specifically planter boxes and pots for city and container potscaping. Okay, so now that we have our bed types covered, you're gonna consider where that you, uh, where you are going to grow. You have to start asking yourself what to grow or what do I want to eat? And we recommend making a list of what you eat or what you wanna experiment with. But if you're doing it for the first time, definitely what you enjoy eating the most. Um, and also consider overplanting is a thing because oftentimes you don't realize that one vegetable plant can produce a lot. So if you have to harvest everything at once, um, it can add up very quickly. So the high yielding crops are tomatoes, cucumbers, beans, zucchini at times, and then um, you can plant an abundance of things like spinach, lettuce, beets, carrots, because they're low producers as one seed equals one plant. So think about that. Um, and then once you have your list, you wanna see what you can buy as seeds. Um, considering that we're going into May to for weekend, it's late to start seeds indoors uh, to plant for the May to for weekend. Um, but things like carrots, beans, peas, Potatoes, radish, uh, spinach, they can all be planted directly outside. And then you can actually sow your bean and beet seeds directly outside now. And then you can keep your end carrots and then you can keep your fall crop seeds. Um, things again, like carrots and spinach aside to plant towards the end or mid, mid to late summer. Um, and then your heat loving plants, like all of your peppers, your tomatoes, your eggplants, herbs, melons, um, those can all be purchased as seedlings. And seedlings suppliers, Lana and I both can tell you, they have stepped up their game this year. So <laughs> there is much more available. There are way, there's a ton of new varieties um, that weren't available before. So yeah, have fun with um, the shopping. So you may think that you could grow most uh, vegetables in containers, and actually you can, but just consider it this way, the size of a plant, like something like corn, you're not gonna plant that in a container. So we're gonna share with you uh, some of the veggies that 
you will be more successful with if you try them. So all of these that we listed right here uh, do very well in containers, different sizes of containers. Lettuce, beet, tomato, peppers, beans, cucumbers, herbs, eggplant, and squash. And we'll also go over the different sizes of containers you may need for any of those. So for uh, larger plants, uh, you need a larger pot, obviously, or a planter box. So we would consider large to be uh, plants like tomatoes, zucchini, eggplants. You can plant any one of those individually in a pot, or we're also going to show you how you can mix them up as well. Um, medium size uh, container might be carrots, radishes, uh, beets. Um, bush beans, peppers, and you can use a quite a variety of small containers to plant up herbs, radishes, lettuce, peas. For herbs, you can also have them in individual and make a nice little arrangement that way. And just something that we wanted to mention while we're going over containers is that some plants are going to require some kind of a support system. So tomatoes, for example, may require a tomato cage. Um, you can use a trellis or a tomato cage for cucumbers, melons, squash. Um, you can use an obelisk as well or some netting if you have a way to support it. But just uh, some thoughts. And after you know what size of container you're going to use, you must note that all containers are not created equally. Um, so you do not want your plants sitting in water. You don't want the water to get logged or you don't want your soil to become fully saturated because that actually um, impedes water intake and it's more detrimental to a plant to be um, in or to have excess water than to be dry. Um, so we recommend that you always check the bottom of your pots for drainage holes. You may have to drill the holes in there, or sometimes you have to use a screwdriver to kind of poke them out. Um, so yeah, ensure drainage can properly occur. Um, again, materials also play a difference in how fast uh, the, the soil dries out. If you're using plastic containers, it's better to water less or to always check your soil before watering. If you're using clay or wood, the, the material clay and wood actually interact. Um, they're breathable, they interact with the atmosphere. Um, they're more porous. And so you will have to water those uh, containers more often, especially clay. clay. Think about clay being in the oven, it tends to bake. Um, and so if you're using clay pots, definitely check your uh, watering amount. Um, you also need to think about things like accessibility. If you need to improve accessibility, you can buy stands for your pots or you can choose the option of planter boxes because they come to, wa uh, to waste height. Um, and then if you're in a, a balcony or a place where you're cautious of um, water ruining or tampering with your floor, you can also check for saucers that are sold um, oftentimes accompanying pots. And that's just a few examples for you. So you can see in the very first picture, uh, I mentioned tomato plant being a larger plant. So that's a fair sized pot that's gonna hold a lot of soil and a lot of water. Um, and a smaller container, you can do something like a mixed herb planter in something like that. And I've seen these at the dollar stores. And just another option of a container. Um, I love this hanging basket with lettuce. Um, if you've ever been gardening in the ground and your slugs have discovered your lettuce, this uh, last slide of lettuce in a hanging pot is a great option for uh, little creepy crawlies that, uh, that are in the ground and slugs love lettuce. Oh, they do. <laughs> they you know they do, yeah. Okay, so we are approaching the fun part. We are actually going to start virtually and visually <laughs> assembling our containers. Uh, we're going to walk through the constituents of what we actually buy and use. 
And then we'll go through our installation how-to guide. All right, for potting mix, you want to look for soilless mixes for containers. And I won't go into uh, what a soilless mix means, but you're gonna look for options which are formulated as potting mixes. Um, and it'll clearly say on the bag of soil or soilless mix that it is meant for containers or that it is all purpose and serves a duality of uh, in-ground or potting uh, and containers. Um, and that is because, again, you have to consider drainage. You want a very lightweight substrate. You want the water to saturate, but also drain at the same time. Um, and garden soil is just way too heavy for containers. Just take our word for it. You never want to put that into your container. It will compact. It'll become um, almost clay-like in a container. Um, okay. And we also get a lot of questions about how to feed uh, veggies as they're growing in containers through the summer. But honestly, if you've used a potting mix um, that may already contain some slow release fertilizer, then you shouldn't need to be too concerned with additional feeding through the summer. Um, now, there are some that are a little more um, heavy feeders, uh, things like tomatoes and members of the brassica family, like broccoli and ca cauliflower. Um, cabbage, kale, uh, if you have any of those, uh, then about midsummer, you may want to start looking at giving it additional uh, food. And we're not going to list them here uh, for our purposes tonight, but there are so many different options on the market. You can use a water soluble kind of instant fertilizer. You can use a granular slow release, but just for the heavy feeders. And I uh, and other than that, if you start to see that you might have some, some issues, um, there's lots of resources that if you take pictures of your plant, um, you can share with, uh, with some resources to find out if you have a nutrient deficiency and then you wanna maybe mitigate that a little bit. But otherwise, don't worry too much about it. And when it comes to watering, um, we'll recommend that after you, you pot things up and we're gonna go through the step-by-step, -step, like I mentioned, um, it's always a great idea. And this is for house plants as well. Leave a couple of inches at the top uh, of the pot for water to um, be able to thoroughly soak the soil instead of spilling over the pot. I don't know if you ever had that happen to you. Um, I know this and it still happens to me because I forced so many, so many uh, different mixed plants into pots. But that's just a good tip. Just remember to leave that space at the top and your plants will be uh, will be thanking you, especially when the, the heat comes on in uh, July and August. And early in the season, you'll definitely notice that the soil will stay moist uh, much longer as there really won't be many roots. Um, but as the weather, as, as they grow and the roots grow and the weather gets hotter, you'll need to water more frequently with a larger amount of water. Um, but if any point... Um, the soil has dried to the point where it starts to shrink away from the sides of the pot. And you've probably all seen this if you've ever bought a 10 inch hanging basket from a box store on May 24th weekend or Mother's Day. Uh, by July, um, it, it can't hold enough water. So when it dries, it, what will happen is the water will just run right through and not get to the space in the roots where it's needed. So if it dries at that point, give it a little water, wait a few minutes, come back again and water it again. So what's happening is the first time you water really dry uh, compact soil is that it starts to open up the soil a little bit. And then when you go back around and water again, it will actually absorb that water. Um, most of these, I, I would say all of these potting mixes contain a lot of peat moss and it just does shrink as as it uh, dries. Mira, this is me? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we told you that we were gonna go through a step-by-step. -step. This is really quick, um, really easy, uh, but if you've been taking notes, maybe just jot this down uh, in case you forget. So basically, it, just gather your materials. It's really great to have everything available all at the same time. Um, use a table if uh, that, that's easier for you. 
and you want to fill your container with soil, not quite all the way to the top, um, just remembering leave a few inches as we mentioned before, but even leave a little bit of less amount of that because you're going to be adding uh, some soil with the plants that you put in. So fill the container um, close to the top, just a few inches away. And this is a good time to add any organic amendments uh, if you haven't already purchased one that has some nutrients in it. Um, so you can add um, slow release fertilizer at this point or bone meal, anything like that. And then what I usually do, and I think Mira does as well, is I take my potted plants and then I start to arrange them the way I'd like to see them. If I'm making like a nice looking um, arrangement of vegetables and flowers and trailers, then I might put the just sit the taller one in the middle and then just see how much space you have for the, all the rest. Once you're happy with the layout, um, then just start taking them out of the pots and digging them into your soil. And it's as, uh, it's as simple as that. Um, and then if you still need some more soil at the top, just make sure that all of the roots are covered really, really well and uh, just top with more soil and then water it in and to settle all the soil around the roots, nice and tidy. This is also a great time to add any plant supports. Don't forget those. I don't know if you've ever tried to put a peony over a, a peony cage over a peony when it's already in flower and falling all over the place or put a tomato cage in a uh, pot of tomatoes when it's already big, you will break most of the plant. So, Think about it ahead of time and put it on at this stage. Okay, so I kind of, uh, we came up with a list of container combinations um, that we really have enjoyed over some of the years. Uh, one of my favorites is definitely uh, the Mediterranean blend of beans, eggplant, Thai basil, green onion, and then I love, um, actually both of us really enjoy our herb planters as well. So um, I like to tightly pack all my herbs and then, then just eat a, or harvest them um, like very frequently. So mixed herbs that you can throw together well in a container are thyme, sage, chives, basil, oregano, uh, lemongrass, coriander, and parsley. Some things to consider are you definitely can't combine everything. Things that spread by rhizome or root um, or things that kind of take over as weeds need to be planted separately or in solo containers. And uh, we've listed some of those things out. Also the things that get really large if you're working with a small space, a small space, consider that zucchini can actually get, it's a big plant. Um, it also has scales sometimes. So you wanna make sure that you kind of put that in a corner in a solo pot. Um, and when planting things next to each other, you have to account for things like your plant heights, uh, your plant width, how they grow, are they vining, um, nutrient requirements, pathogen susceptibility, root zones. If you, if you put plants together, are they gonna compete for the same root niche? Um, so my personal opinion is that uh, learning your plant combinations is very experience-based and experimental. So try what you would like to try. And if it doesn't work, you know not to put those two things together the next year. Um, you can also use plant compatibility charts that are found online. And also learn your compact varieties. So there are many vegetable varieties that are great specifically grown in containers and they'll actually um, grow as dwarf or compact. Some of them you may lose some flavor, but then you'll be able to pack more in the container. All right, so um, this is just an image. Uh, we've had a lot of text, so we just wanted to throw in a few pictures for you to get a visual. On the left-hand side is actually one of the planters that I did at a client's place. It was for the cold crops. So it was ruby red lettuce, it was spinach, uh, kale, radish, peas, and herbs on the left-hand side. And then, uh, Lana? And this is the kind of container that I would love to see everywhere. I would love to have 
a mix of vegetable, edible, and flower containers just take over all the strictly ornamental ones because I love them. Isn't it gorgeous? So um, most people don't spend this kind of money on an obelisk, but you know what I did just yesterday? I actually took uh, some bamboo stakes, spray painted them black and turned them into a little kind of a fort, kind of a little structure um, and added it into a, a, a plant or similar to this. So right here in the middle, uh, you'll see uh, cucumbers growing up the obelisk. That one flower in the front um, that's spilling over towards the left hand side with the round, the big round leaves, that's nasturtium. It's a beautiful trailing plant in your garden in a container. And if you put it in the garden, uh, they'll keep the weeds down really nice because it grows really, really fast and kind of takes over around your other desirable plants. And all parts of that plant are actually edible. Um, on the right hand side, again in the front, you'll see a little baby marigold. I think that one's called little, little gem. That's one of my favorite actually. And a um, flowering cabbage. So um, I would love to see pictures of anybody from this talk ends up doing something like this uh, by the end of the season. Please send me a picture. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Um, and like Lana said, um, we're already thinking about pictures. So I guess now that you guys are all envisioning um, your arrangements and designing in your head, we're gonna go over the last bit of detail, just briefly some other considerations like attracting beneficials, the power of using flowers, uh, pest control methods and a little bit of aftercare techniques and then we'll let you get back to uh, headscaping. And for Richard, we can't tell you how to grow poutine, I'm sorry. So let's talk about really briefly, what are beneficials? We hear that term uh, thrown around quite a lot, um, but we don't always stop and think as to what it is maybe. So a beneficial uh, in the way of an insect is basically a bug which performs a beneficial activity um, for our gardens or for the environment as a whole. Um, they're really vital pollinators and they're essential to most of our food crops. Anything that has a flower and a fruit, like something that, like a tomato versus let's say a, um, something that's grown in the ground as root vegetable like a carrot, needs beneficial insects to pollinate them. And you'd be surprised to know, if you didn't already know this, that many insects are actually important predators um, of the pests in our gardens and they keep their numbers in check. So I'll tell you a little bit about just a few of the good guys <clears throat> that if you happen to see these, just watch and observe at what they're doing in the garden. If you have any one of these, chances are you have a plant pest that is munching on your garden and uh, these guys may be just doing their job. So from clockwise, uh, the first one um, is a ladybug larva. So it's a baby ladybug before he uh, develops his wings. And those guys are voracious. They can eat um, like three times their body weight a day in aphids. So those are the good guys. I remember the first time I saw one, I didn't know what the heck it was. And I was just really, really pleased uh, to find that it was a ladybug. Um, because yeah, as a, as a, as a newborn, as a little one, um, they're pretty, they're pretty ugly. So next is our cute uh, iconic ladybug that we all know, and it is doing its job right here as well as it munches on some mealybugs. Another great um, insect to have in your garden if you come across them is a praying mantis. Uh, they will also eat so many bugs uh, that are eating your plants. And um, bottom right, uh, that's a lacewing, very pretty. Um, another really nice bug to have around. Uh, middle one, um, that's actually a parasitic wasp. And these guys are great because what they do, if you have tomatoes, if you've ever seen a tomato hornworm, for example, like in the last picture, um, very similar to that one there, they will actually insert their eggs into a caterpillar and the caterpillar will parasitize the, um, 
or sorry, the um, the eggs will parasitize the, the caterpillar and uh, kind of brutal, I know, kind of gruesome, but uh, this is uh, nature, right? But that's just to introduce you to a few of the good guys. And we talked a little bit, well, probably quite a bit about adding flowers to your arrangements. Don't be afraid to um, just uh, get creative and add a few. And we're gonna share a couple here um, that we like. And this is how you attract as well, a lot of these beneficial insects to, um, to your space where you're growing. So sunflowers is probably the heaviest hitter when it comes to what it can do for your garden, um, including attracting beneficials. Um, oh, I think I have a, I'm not, I'm not sure if, the typing is off on this slide, but the next one that's an orange, uh, it should say nasturtium and not cosmos. If it says cosmos, like it shows on my screen, um, that's uh, my bad. It is actually an orange nasturtium. I think I copied and pasted and kind of messed up there. The last one on this one is chamomile. Uh, Again, any, any of these little tiny flowers, uh, they are great at attracting those parasitic wasps. They really, really love them. And then with chamomile, you get tea. And I think everybody must have heard about using French marigolds in with your uh, vegetables to do a multitude of different things. They happen to be kind of stinky. Um, a lot of people don't like the smell of it. Well, there's a lot of bugs that don't like the smell either. So if you add French marigolds around some of your plants, uh, it may actually deter some of these pests. And Cosmos, another great one for attracting so many different kinds of great uh, bugs. And the last one, Calendula. Um, really, really pretty, um, but I've seen it at Mira's farm actually. And uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about why you like Calendula uh, mixed in with your vegetables, Mira. Yeah, so this is one of our favorite uh, observations that we made was that I had planted a row of calendula because I wanted to mix it in uh, with some of my beeswax. And I planted that just to harvest the flowers. And all of a sudden, as, as it matures and as it flowers, I just notice it's filled with activity. Um, I notice less uh, flea beetle holes in my stuff. I notice all of these crazy bad insects all over my calendula. And um, then I did some more research on it and it's actually used as a trap prop. So Lana and I are now just completely obsessed with calendula. I planted it everywhere. It does seed like crazy, so it will become a weed. Um, you have to use it, um, use it where you really need to use it. And again, if it's in containers, it's okay because you can then control it. You're not gonna introduce it to your space. But yeah, really recommend using that. And then you can also, as we said, harvest the flowers, dry it and use it in tea or um, add it into your soap making or uh, projects at home, DIY projects. Oh, okay. So <laughs> it's hard to talk about the bad guys, um, but we need to we need to get familiar with some of these uh, potential threats and pests that you will find on some of your stuff. And so the most common um, were or on some of my crops were flea beetle, striped cucumber beetle, Colorado potato be beetle, and I'm moving in a clockwise direction again. Um, slugs, the squash bug, and cabbage worms are actually two types, um, so I just categorize them into one, and they will devastate your brassicas. Oh, and there's one more which I actually don't have much experience with, but uh, Lana taught me about these guys. So Lana, would you please explain? Dun dun dun. Yeah, <laughs> and I can get the same feeling when I see them. Um, so if you if you've gardened, if you have a lawn at some point uh, during that journey, you have come across a Japanese beetle. Um, if you don't garden, then you probably know them as white grubs. So their first life stage is actually as a grub form in your lawn and they'll eat they eat eat roots, so they'll, they'll eat grass roots. Um, one thing that I will mention quickly about white grubs, I know this is not a veggie thing, but um, if you find one or two, don't worry about it, just throw it, 
throw it on the road, the robins will come and find it. Um, they only create uh, significant damage in your lawn if there is more than, let's say, 10 or 12 per square foot. So that's all I'll say about white grubs. But they turn into uh, Japanese beetles as they, as they mature. So this bug, uh, it's not native to our space. It, it's not native to our country at all. Uh, it was introduced. And part of the issue with a lot of these insects and plants as well that are introduced, they have no natural predators here. So this guy happens to be one that eats so many different kinds of plants, vegetables, flowers, trees, you name it, uh, there's a lot of different kinds. So he's really not very picky. It is not a specialist at all. Like we probably know about how um, monarch butterflies can only eat milkweed. These guys eat everything. So they're quite a nuisance. And I've honestly found like the best way to um, take care of them, if you have the patience and if it's not, you don't have too much of a garden, too many plants, is to just go out early in the morning with a with a bucket of soapy water. In the morning, they're really, really slow um, and they'll be just hanging on the plants. And then you can just knock them into a bucket and then um, you can dispose of it that way. Um, that's really the, the best way that I find. Um, if you'll, you'll notice in the heat of the day, they're just too fast. They just fly, fly away when they're disturbed. And um, I mean, Another option, you know what, remember how I mentioned throwing the grubs to the robins? Um, if you have chickens like Mary, you can feed them to the chickens. The chickens will really, really be happy. And that just reminds me of something that a farmer had told me last year. Um, we were talking about different kinds of bugs and slugs and Japanese beetles. And he said, you know what? He said, most gardens don't have a bug issue. They don't have a bug problem. They have a chicken deficiency. And I really believe that. <laughs> but if you ever let chickens loosen your uh, in your veggies, uh, they will eat all your veggies too. So maybe just, just throw them, keep them on a leash. I'm going to set up a grub depot around <laughs> Ottawa. Uh, and so as Lena mentioned, one of the most effective methods of organic pest control is uh, hand picking. So definitely get your soapy water buckets ready and Guys, soon you will, you'll start by wearing gloves and doing it. You'll be like, oh, I don't want to touch that. And then mid-season, you'll just be ripping off the gloves. You'll just have insect guts flying all, all over you. And that's when you know uh, you really are a gardener and you believe in organic uh, totally. And so another couple techniques that I use um, and a reason I, that I didn't have holes in my broccoli and cabbage or cauliflower was because um, a friend of mine told me to use preemptive applications of BTK. It's an organic spray that contains bacteria that you can purchase from any hardware store. Um, so you just want to spray that early in the season after you transplant them, after they get uh, over transplant shock, you can start spraying them with BTK um, if it rains, apply it again. Once the bacteria gets established, you are protected. Um, and for beetles like the flea beetle, potato beetle, and cucumber, something called pyrethrum works really well. And um, that's a natural insecticide, again, that is made from the dried flower of chrysanthemum. Um, for slugs, I did not have any success with organic control. <laughs> I tried everything. I wasted so much beer on them <laughs> and uh, was very upset because you can bait them by using beer and that did not work for me. So I unfortunately had to use um, slug bait and in slug bait are orthophosphates. Again, it's not organic, but I did apply it to the outer ends of the rows, so none of the lettuce actually came in contact with the pellets. So it's really up to you, and know that if you do, if you have to succumb to using uh, an, um, a chemical or a substance, it's okay. Just consider um, changing up the application or per, like distance away from your crops. And then, if all else fails, you can also use row cover. Oops. So we're getting close to the end now. We just want to leave you with some 
some final thoughts on aftercare. So one of the things that I can't stress enough is to visit your plants daily until at least until you get to know them and their needs. Um, I tell people the same thing with house plants. Just just go in and just have a look, inspect, um, because early detection of health issues are crucial to being successful. And what how it usually happens is because you're getting to know your your plants so well, how they're behaving, how they're growing. If you see some spots of yellow or you see something that's a wilty leaf, like you're just going to notice it right away and you're just going to go, oh, that looks a little different. Then go in for a closer look and you might be surprised that you um, may discover exactly what the issue is, but early detection for sure. And we'd also recommend to check the soil for watering every day, not water every day, but check it, check it to see, um, as opposed to actually watering on a schedule. Um, so we would only want you to water, especially in containers when they need it, as opposed to the set schedule. Um, like I mentioned before, early in the season, um, and then on cloudy days as well, like they're gonna need a lot less. And you're gonna get to know uh, their watering needs fairly quickly. So get your fingers dirty and uh, feel the soil. And you may have to feel in a little bit deeper. Um, for if you're still not convinced that you're gonna be able to tell, then one uh, trick that I use uh, for people is just take a long skinny wooden stick and push it into the soil like probably along the side of the pot and think like a paint stick. Um, you'll be able to determine if the soil is moist or dry. For anyone that bakes and you use a toothpick uh, in the middle of like a cake or a cupcake, um, same idea. If you pull this uh, stick out and you see moisture, then you're, you're fine, the soil is good. If you pull it out and you don't see any moisture or any soil sticking to that stick, then it probably needs to water. So that's a good uh, option uh, for you if you're still nervous about learning to water. And not all, all veggies will require additional feeding like we mentioned through the summer, uh, but when in doubt, just use a low dose feed. And we really want to encourage you to have fun and get creative. Just try, just do it. Um, we've shared a lot of information in a very, very short time. Um, but if you just take away three points, four points, five points, anything at all um, that you use this year to help you feel uh, willing to try and help you feel successful, and that's what we're looking for. And uh, as Lana mentioned in the beginning, we work together. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to both of us, either one of us. Um, we um, really just couldn't, it's almost like we couldn't help but work together because we complement each other so well. Um, so the collaboration was very natural. And if you want to know more, just check out our uh, websites. And thank you, and we hope that you all have so many happy harvests to come. Thank you, everybody. And like we said, we'll stay Thanks. around for some questions. <laughs>